so uh, just to, um, I'm going to st just start with sort of the basic orientation of sort of how Agor the Agoric stack, how Agoric sees the world, and how this relates to what all of us are discussing. So uh, we've also had in mind this completely cross-platform world, uh, chain, multiple chains, non-chains. Uh, in this diagram, each, each individual rectangle is a physical machine, but each stack is a logical machine. So from our perspective, a chain is just a highly credible machine. A uh, highly credible logical machine, uh, it's mutually credible because of the massive replication and agreement. Uh, but uh, uh, we're just building a distributed system across such virtual machines. So we build on top of it. Sorry, what's quorum versus volume? Oh, a quorum is just like a, a classic uh, PBFT with no, uh, you know, with, with just a permissioned uh, validator. Right. Side. Private blockchain, right? Hyperledger, yeah, yeah, or yeah, hyperledger, yeah. Um, uh, and you know, so we also want to be you know cross private and public. Um, uh, we just want to be cross everything. Okay, so then this is the VAT level. Uh, each VAT is a process-like unit, and the VATs are only asynchronously coupled to each other, which is sort of the defining characteristic of VAT. And when we have multiple VATs sitting on a chain, we have sort of this internal operating system-like uh, way to convey messages between VATs on the same chain. And then between chains, uh, we, you know, what we arrived at was some of those, uh, which we call VAT VP, is very, very much like IBC. And that's, that's largely you know, what, I'm, what I'm hoping we all reconcile and bring together into one mechanism. Okay, and then our application layer uh, starts by built by layering on this a system of distributed object capabilities, and we're using the JavaScript language to do that. Uh, but the, the the mechanism is actually not JavaScript specific, and other languages can play in this. Uh, but but I'll just stick with JavaScript. Uh, and the key idea here is that objects within a VAT can just point at each other with regular object pointers, uh, and they have their local capabilities by virtue of the local safe language techniques. And then uh, let's skip the between VATs within the same platform. Um, uh, objects qu qu pointing to objects elsewhere on other chains or other platforms. Um, uh, this is layered on the cryptographic protocols here. But the point is that all of this should have object capability safety semantics. That all of these references are capabilities and messages between objects in different VATs, whether local or remote, if they're between VATs, they can only be asynchronous messages. Oh, so these are um, uh, actually I can I can now talk about it using the terminology I learned yesterday. Um, those are channels. These are channels between bats. Um, over here, um, we see two different channels between this chain and the chain that this guy's riding on. Um, right. So these would be multiplexed over one connection, which isn't shown, but the main thing is that uh, every inter -VAT connection is um, uh, at this level, we can think about as a channel, and then we're multiplexing multiple object references on one channel. And what's the rule for creating these channels? The, the rule for creating them? Yeah, it's on its own, yeah, so great question. It's uh, completely, Dynamically driven based on introduction. Um, uh, and um, there will be a lot more detail about yeah. introduction. Yes. There are animations for that. Right. And fast so, are mutually distrusted, like modules. That that's one? right. Is that, that, uh, one object, one? Even yes, objects right. within a VAT are mutually distrusting, VATs are mutually distrusting, and platforms are mutually distrusting. So it's mutually suspicious objects and mutually suspicious VATs. Talking to mutually suspicious to to, you know, to other mutually suspicious objects on mutually suspicious bats. Are bats communicating with each other asynchronously even they are within the same machine? Yes, yes. The vat the vat by definition is the unit of synchrony. So each vat is an island of synchrony in a sea of asynchrony, and all inter vat messages even on the same chain are only asynchronous. There's actually a minor exception to that which we should ignore. But not the inter Right, right. Within a single VAT, you have normal 
synchronous, normal conventional synchronous call return semantics between objects. Um, but if you want to, you can do an asynchronous. Thing. Yes, that's right. And so that might be important to defend yourself against the, the uh, temporal behavior of the person you want. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's very important. Is that you've got two send operations: synchronous <coughs> send, which is called conventional uh, sequential call return, and asynchronous send with the promise for the result. Uh, and you get the restriction is synchronous send <coughs> only within a bag, asynchronous send anywhere. And then on top of this, we build our e rights and smart contracting layer. Um, and uh, there's a loop here, which, which we consider to be very important to the nature of, this, of the rights and contracts we're creating, which is smart contracts manipulate rights. But any contract that unfolds over time, the continued participation in that contract is itself a valuable position to be in. So we want to make that position a tradable right itself, the, the, the right to continue to participate in the contract from that position. And that's the way you get, oh, um, jumped ahead there a little bit. So, so, the, um, so over here, these are the three protocol layers of our system. So this is, what we've been calling VATTP, which we're trying to reconcile with IBC. Um, then on top of that, we build CAPTP. Um, uh, so CAPTP builds capabilities out of VATs. VATTP builds VATs out of machines. And ERTP builds rights and smart contracting uh, out of capabilities. So sorry, I missed this, but how do you, I don't know if in IBC we have this notion of carving out this VATTP from the they would be modules. Yeah. Bats yeah. are roughly yeah. modules, but we don't really talk IBC between modules because yeah. I mean, they're not really asynchronous. That's what I'm wondering what's the equivalent. And, and, and well, in, in our test net, there's a single module that has multiple bats inside of it. And so any two, any two things, any two bats inside our swing set module talk directly to each other. Anything that talks off chain goes through something that comes up. That's right. I mean, if there were um, somehow asynchronous, if you can solve the determinism problems. Uh, modules running on a single blockchain it might might well make them make sense to have to communicate through IBC. Right. <laughs> yeah. And assuming you can do loop back oh, in IBC, then you can do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the key thing over here is um, that because the um, we have this generic notion of E-Write that covers fungible and non-fungible. Uh, that covers, covers shareable and exclusive, and, you know, just the, the range of variation of rights. And we're phrasing most of our contracts so that they're not specific to one kind of right. They can deal with any right that's described in the ERTP. And the right to participate in the contract is itself the kind of right that, that is described in the ERTP. The result is you have higher order composition. The, the, rights, the derived rights produced by creating a contract is still the kind of right that any gener generically parameterizable contract can accept as input. So you can easily build networks of contracts. We'll give you this slide deck, by the way. So. Yeah, cool. OK. So uh, let's uh, first of all concentrate on the object capability layer. Uh, the key, the key um, uh, mechanism, the key transaction at the object capability layer is just the message send, where uh, object Alice invokes object Bob passing reference to Carol, uh, and the result is that Bob, on, that Alice is both exercising her capability to Bob in doing that. She's provoking whatever um, uh, behavior is, is the result of invoking Bob, and she's also giving Bob permission to invoke Carol, whereas previously he didn't have it. And the key thing about previously our capability system, not. what? Previously he might not. Well, previously he might not have, right. In this diagram, we can see that he doesn't. Um, uh, so the, the key thing is that in the object capability model, ideally, only these references carry, carry causality. There's no other causal channel. Uh, and the result is that the reference graph from the programming language literature is identical to the access graph from the access world literature, et cetera. Okay. Uh, and then dot is the way we notate the immediate call. So that's called return semantics. You can only do it within a bat. And then the bang is the eventual send where you get a you, that's the asynchronous one where what you're doing conceptually is you're um, 
you're queuing on, on the queue of wherever Bob is, whether Bob is local or remote, there's some, there, each VAT is associated with, with an incoming message queue. You're queuing on the queue of the VAT hosting Bob the need to eventually deliver the message foo of Carol to Bob. And each of those queued messages is a separate atomic transaction. We call it a turn of the event. Uh, and, um, and so you get these nice tempor this nice temporal operation, isolation of each separate eventual message. So somebody both operator in some sense, you, because you talk about acknowledgments, you sort of go there until it's done, right? So, uh, yeah, so, so the, the, with the dot, you're only doing that among objects within the same fat. But yes, the semantics of it is that um, the callee, the caller is completely blocked until the callee is done. Uh, and there's a very important side effect contract here, which is um, uh, uh, they have opposite pros and cons with regard to reasoning about correctness. Uh, with the dot, um, you know that, nothing, that no side effects have happened between the caller making the request and the callee receiving the request. Uh, that, that it's sort of an instantaneous transfer. Um, uh, but the callee is receiving the request while there's a call stack above them, and therefore local object invariants might be suspended because various ca the callers on the call chain uh, might have suspended invariants while they're making the call. So it's really sort of useful for uh, sub goal, where you're trying to do something as part of a larger goal. Um, uh, eventual send. Um, uh, you're guaranteed that every reception starts with an empty stack, so all invariants, all lo local VAT invariants should be restored, but it happens an arbitrary time later, so other, inter under other events may have interleaved, changing state in other ways. So it's exactly the, 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 um, the opposite of pros and cons. Just curious, what, what uh, language is this? <laughs> uh, this is... Uh, Okay, so the, so the exclamation mark uh, is a syntactic sugar that we've proposed to the ECMAScript committee. Uh, so we hope that it actually, the infix bang, we hope that it actually appears in a future version of JavaScript. Uh, what we're actually doing in code right now is we're, we're doing something, we're writing it without the infix bang using function composition. Basically, we're emulating um, infix bang approximately what the bang would be sugar to. Uh, but, but, but the infix bang is where we think about it and the way we'd like to present it on slides. Uh, other than the infix bang, everything we're seeing here is genuine JavaScript. In the code examples you see later, you'll see a function called capital B that's used to, to represent this in the t shirt. Oh, you're right. I copied the actual code, so you will see that. I forgot to put the, the infix bang. Instead of saying Bob bang foo, we say capital E of Bob. Close friend, not food. Yeah. Okay. So, sorry, uh, so these queues are, no. do you assume that they are infinite? Or and is this like. That's a flow control issue. Oops. So, yes, assume they're infinite. Okay. Yeah. For, for the that's for, for <laughs> model. That's Obviously, that's right. in production systems, they're not. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. But when you get to, to resource exhaustion on message, message delivery, there's a whole bunch of, of messy stuff that we need to pay, probably pay more attention to than we have, but, we, but we're aware of those issues. Uh, but the underlying model, the first way to think of it is assume that you have infinite memory, sort of the standard symbolic programming language assumption. <laughs> Alice has a reference to Bob. Yeah. So the, the, the local so Bob is a local is an instance variable of the Alice object, which is this this dot over here represents the Alice object holding a local instance variable, holding a part of her state, a reference to Bob, just the variable Bob, and much like the variable Carol is this dot. Um, and because Alice has a reference to both, she can connect the two. Uh, but if, the, if Bob does not already have a reference to Carol, Bob can only come to have a reference to Carol by virtue of an introduction like this. And so we, we, we use the phrase, only connectivity begets connectivity to sort of uh, emphasize this graph isolation property. In the simple case, once uh, Alice invokes a method on Bob and passes Carol, Bob can do whatever Bob wants from Carol, right? He That's right. Copy Carol, he can send Carol on. 
Well, so so he, he can, can store. He, so so what? He can store his reference. Yeah, yeah, he can store it. So so he can pass his reference on, but he can only pass it on to destinations that he himself has access sure, to. Sure. Right. So, so, and which is, by the way, I mean, the reason I emphasize that is a tremendous amount of the access control literature that ignores the ability to impose controls there. If Bob is part of an isolated subgraph, when we give him Carol, he can't cause Carol to exit the subgraph. We still have this containment property. Right. So much of the, the consequences of, of OCAP security, of the OCAP rules, are that kind of graph containment and that the, the, the reachability graph corresponds to the limits of what you're allowed to do or act. Yeah, and the a crucial thing that this that this slideshow doesn't uh, help visualize, but it's, I have other things, is that if Alice doesn't want to give Bob full access to Carol, yeah. what Alice does instead is she creates an attenuator, an intermediate object that front ends to Carol, prevents part of Carol's authority, acts like Carol typically, uh, except in this attenuated way and then passes Bob access to the attenuator. So the classic example is a revocable forwarder that is a temporal only forwarder. The, the forwarder acts fully like Carol because we'll forward all messages to Carol until Alice tells the forwarder to stop send, send forwarding messages, in which case it will stop completely. Um, uh, but you can, you can attenuate in all sorts of different aspects of authority. Is it important to understanding that that we understand the physical or network layer message flow, like if Alice creates an attenuator to the messages from Bob to Carol then go through Alice, or is that kind of abstracted away? Uh, so it is important for some purposes. Um, it's important especially under partition. So um, if, if Alice just does it the normal way, then you're exactly right about what the consequence is, that the attenuator is running in the same vat as Alice, and all messages from Bob then go through Alice's attenuator. Mm -hmm. Now, because the VATs are mutually suspicious, it obviously doesn't work under the normal assumptions for Alice to, to create the attenuator in Bob's VAT, in VAT B. However, it does work for Alice to create the attenuator in VAT C because the nature of Carol, the nature of the rights being attenuated is according to VAT C anyway. Sure, right. So you're not... There's no additional vulnerability by putting the attenuator there, uh, and you have better connectivity properties under partition, except for one issue, which is if, if it's in VAT A, then no matter what partition happens, Alice knows that once she revokes, Bob cannot access Carol. If it's in VAT C and there's an AC partition, mm -hmm. then it might be that Alice wants to revoke, but cannot because she can't get the revoke message to the attenuator. Sure. So for that one, we introduce uh, in the e-work, not yet in the JavaScript work, um, a concept called a dead man switch. The what? A dead man switch, which, says, which basically says which, where, we, where if a proper client of the attenuator uh, is, is you know, if some client might not be able to get a message to the attenuator promptly, the attenuator reacts to the inability of the client to connect to it by uh, uh, falling back to a safe state, which would be to stop forwarding messages. Yeah, it, 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 well, it knows that, that all it knows is that a client might not be able to uh, that a legitimate message that a client might want to send to it that it might not be able to, and therefore it should it should it should go into a safe state until it hears from the client. Because usually we build a dead man switch out of keyboards. Right. Right. Okay. Um, one other aspect is that it might be safe to put the attenuator on Bob if Bob is running inside the chain. If you get credibility out of that vat, then, right. uh, then you have more assurances than you know, Bob can't actually influence the attenuator that you set up. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and that one, unlike all the others, would be an additional trust assumption. So if you have the trust assumption, if Alice is willing to trust that B, even though she doesn't trust Bob, then she can do exactly that. And um, yeah, okay. So, um, uh, so with this being sort of the, the general object-object uh, you know, relationship, then when you um, divide this into VATs or divide this into platforms, what you find is 
that there's exactly five ways in which this graph can be cut between platforms. And the most challenging way, one is this one. This is the one that brings up all of the issues. If you solve this one, then you can solve all the others as kind of the generic cases of that one. So let's focus in on that. Okay. Um, over here, I'm going to do a simplified form of CAPTP that predates Brian's work on swing set, um, uh, where you just have um, a single CAPTP per VAT, ignoring the local operating system issue. Um, so you basically have the local SES secure ECMAScript language. Then you have the CAPTP serialization, unserialization around that. Um, and then, of course, you've got all the encryption and, and and that TP stuff beyond that, which I'm going to, I'm just going to assume in the rest of this presentation uh, until we get to naming. Okay. Uh, and um, uh, to give you, so, um, uh, so in order for Alice to have logically a reference to Bob that's elsewhere in the network, she actually has a reference through some bookkeeping in CAPTP that goes across to other bookkeeping in CAPTP over here, and the parent goes to Bob. So uh, these arrows are sort of the, the directions represented by different parts of bookkeeping, and I'm showing, and, but the arrows are too big, so I'm truncating them uh, into that notation, but I'm showing you the arrows first so you understand what the directionality is that's implied by this notation. So basically, these are different tables, and because chains can't keep secrets, the constraint is that the, that the CAPTP capability to capability hookup has to all be depending only on integrity, can't depend on any in-band confidentiality anywhere. Um, so, uh, so the key thing is that these export tables are, are analogous to C lists in a capability operating system. If you don't know what a C list is, don't worry about it. I'll, I'm about to explain. Um, so Bob is registered in the VAT B export table at some number. It's registered in the corresponding import table in VAT A at the same number. Uh, uh, Alice, when she thinks she's talking to Bob, she's really talking to a local proxy for Bob that just locally acts like Bob. Uh, uh, is embedded at the import table, causes the serialization that uh, gets unserialized at the export table, looking up Bob and delivered. The thing about capability safety uh, without confidentiality, uh, but um, with authentication, is that when that B receives a message from that A, that B can tell that it came from that A, and therefore can interpret the message on these on unserializing it relative to this export table. So A, so that A can cause Bob to be invoked. Uh, that C can only address this export table. And therefore, in this situation, uh, uh, C cannot invoke Bob. And, and in, this is realized by a validity predicate for each fact. That, yeah, exactly, exactly. So this is, this is where all the validity predicates, and this is, and this is where the thinking of VATTP and IBC mm -hmm. has been just incredibly well aligned. Uh, sorry, I had a few confusions. Uh, why does it feel like import and export are backwards? Okay, um, the, the, uh, uh, that's a common thing. Whichever way you do it, half the audience will think it's backwards. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> in this particular case, this is something I am importing from something I am exporting. Yeah. Yeah, that B is exporting Bob for use by that A. So if we take a look at access to the object, I see. I see. Bob is being exported. Who is Bob exporting for? And A for? Yeah. is importing access to Bob. Uh, okay. When yeah. you look at the messages, it's, it's backwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And see. that's always going to be the case. I see. So it's about the access. Right. And then how, why is this this one down here? It says only C can access them. There's no. Right. They're not related yet. No. So they don't know about each other yet. So yeah. what I'm right. doing, I'm just, I'm just visual. Visually, I'm um, using the spatial correspondence to indicate the channel connection, not showing the channel connection. I see. But basically, this pair is matched with this pair, and they're look and A look B looks it up based on a validity predicate that a message came from that C and vice versa. I see. So um, in that drawing, Bob has not been exported to, to 
has C. Right. And so it's not in the table. And that way, there's no expression C can make to, to that B to invoke an operation on top. Right. right. But so the, the only C can access is misleading right yeah, now. That's, so the, no, only, only, the no, only C can access the things in the export table that are for, for use by C. Which, which is, is currently the things nothing. exported to C, which is currently nothing. But, but the key thing is that, that what I'm diagramming here is not so much that it's nothing, but that it doesn't contain dot. Sure, I see. So there may be other so each bat, see. each bat has an import and export table for each other bat. That's right. Uh -huh. That's right. And they're actually cool. created only on an as-needed basis. When they're so introduced. When they're introduced. And now I'm going to go back to a situation where we, where, where, uh, where we don't see the tables yet. Okay. One goes one out of bound bootstrap process. That's right. Great. Something has to get started. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, and then uh, there is two additional tables here, which are the key thing to, be, to doing a no secrecy uh, capability handoff between three VATs, which is this is the table of things that A is asking C to provide to B. This is the table of things that B is asking C to provide to A. It's the handoff, it's the handoff table. So these imports and exports and then handoff tables. So the handoff tables are really about, directly about three-party relationships. Um, but each entry in there, as you're about to see, is very short lived. Um, so, the in, so the thing about the index being in common here is this index is how A talks to B about Bob. Okay, and that, that's just the handoff table explanation I just gave. Okay, so when A sends, says Bob bang foo of Carol, the, uh, that's the asynchronous message, she's sending it to the local proxy. The proxy is part of the CAPTP system, so it causes serialization. Uh, and that causes um, uh, two messages to be emitted. The first message is there's a message that's not shown writing on this, it's not a message to Carol, it's a message uh, to that C, basically a bookkeeping mechanism in that C, that's, that gives an index into the handoff table that says, when that B asks you for this index, give it Carol, and then by Carol, uh, this indicates Carol by using the index in the export table. I see. And then this message, once serialized and then going through all the encryption layers or whatever, is basically A, a sending to B after the, this is where we get into the order. So this is the first example of the triangle order. Uh, this is an adequate example to bring up all the issues, but, but it turns out it's, it's, uh, it's important to remember it's not specific to this scenario. The triangle ordering comes up a lot. <coughs> what the triangle ordering is saying here is after this message has been delivered to that C, then A is telling B, ask that C for what I left for you at the number Carol A to B, and then deliver food to Bob with that argument. So that's effectively what's being encoded there. So it's the, and it's the after, which is the, um, the interesting part of this from the ordering perspective. So to clarify, is this a specific case where we're giving that B a future way to call that C directly without going through A? Is that right? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, okay. yes, yes yeah. exactly. Because otherwise we would just be able to not do this and go that's through right. A. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And okay. a test that does not yet have a pre party handle. So anytime you want to check to that, they have to go through the show. Right. Um, uh, so then, uh, when that B receives the message and unserializes it, the first thing, the part of the unserializing it is to emit a message towards that C that says, um, uh, where that B says to that C, after this message has been delivered to you, uh, then it asks that C, what did that A leave for me at the index Carol A to B? Now, because this whole system is asynchronous, let's imagine that that C is actually offline at the time. So all these messages are just hanging out in some store and forward infrastructure and might not have been delivered yet. Nevertheless, when that B emitted this message, it immediately has a promise for the result of the message. And having created a promise immediately, 
it can now unserialize the incoming foo message, populating the Carol argument with that promise and delivering it to Bob. Okay, now uh, here's where the, tri the interesting triangle order issue comes in, which is that A tried to emit the message on this route, but maybe for whatever reason it's not getting there. Um, and um, that B wants to send this message over here after this message arrives, but wants to take its own responsibility for ensuring that this message arrives so that its continued liveness of other messages after this one doesn't depend on that A succeeding at getting this message to that C. So what's going on here is that the, um, all of the unacknowledged messages in the that A to that C direction, specifically the unacknowledged ones, and this is a low level place where the acknowledgments become really important, is all of the unacknowledged traffic from A to C gets uh, encapsulated in, and as, a, um, as an additional payload in the message that went from A to B. And the right way to think about this is uh, in um, various certificate authorization systems, like Spooky Sudsy, there's a certificate chain. And the certificate chain grows as the delegation chain. This one, the certificate chain is always being truncated by further acknowledgments but it's growing with regard to the unacknowledged traffic in, in a very similar way as a, as a certificate chain for, for, uh, a, a, for a chain of delegations. So this message carries the same uh, encapsulated unacknowledged traffic, or what was the unacknowledged traffic, and if that C gets the traffic redundantly, obviously it's that C's responsibility to detect the duplicates and, and reject the redundancy, uh, but that way, uh, once B receives, receives the message with the, with the unacknowledged A to B traffic, C can take responsibility for making sure that those messages get to B, get to C ahead of further messages from B. So when, so when A sent the, sent the message to B, this, the give to that sent to C was kind of piggyback. It was telling B, like, right. this is, what, what I'm telling you is dependent on this thing being delivered to C. Yeah, sorry yeah. about the... And it's, it's all authenticated kind of independently of any connections. So, uh, so actually, the, the authentication is interesting here, which is, at this point, as far as that B is concerned, all of this unacknowledged traffic doesn't need to be understood by B at all. Right. It's just, here's a bunch of crap yeah. that A is telling B, just go ahead and send this to C yeah. ahead of f further a to C, uh, further B to C traffic right. that is provoked by receiving this message from me. Right. Um, and uh, it's A's responsibility for that tra for that blob of stuff to, to make sense, to validate, to it's still, and, and, so it's, and still validating as having come from A. Right. So even though it's, so there, there's a real separation of sort of the physical routing versus the logical routing. It's, it's just that, and this is where we get the weird abstraction layer crossing, which is in this scenario, in some sense, B is acting as a physical router for this message, but validation-wise, this message is only coming from A. B is not in the validation chain for this message. Can, can you hear that? Yeah, I probably have a bunch of questions. There are two identical copies of this thing, one coming from A, that's right. that gets in the left uh, track. Doing there, and one coming from the later mm -hmm. enters the blind one. Yeah. Why? Well, it's not, it doesn't enter the. Okay, so it enters C. So let's let's go forward. Okay. Okay. So at this point, there's a copy of this message included as in, in as a, as an extra payload in this message, but it's just a blob to be delivered to C as a whole. Whereas if we were doing this over. Uh, point-to-point -point CLS connections that might, or some stored and forward message connections that might be encrypted for C, and B can't even read it. Right, right. So yeah, it's, it's, it's clearest when you think about these as encrypted traffic, which doesn't apply to public chains, but where each of these would be, let's say, a separately um, secret-keeping endpoint that you can encrypt traffic to, then this would just be encrypted by A for C with B having complete 
complete non-visibility into this. So, so I'm going to be. The piggyback coffee, I like coffee. I love 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 for this, this, for this like message, here? can can C execute based on the the piggybacked copy of the message? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. As it far as C is concerned, as long as the message it's validates, it's a message from A. So, but it might arrive out of order with respect to other messages from A to C. So I think. Well, the thing is, the the traffic that's direct from A to C. Yeah. Will be ordered by whatever mechanism A and C are using to coordinate that order. So further traffic from A to C. Um, uh, 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 will, uh, if it's happening before the redundant delivery of this message, there's no problem because then the redundant delivery of this message came later. Right. If it happens after the, 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 the delivery of this message, well then this message came first and there's no violation of order. So in both cases there's no violation of order. What happens if there's messages ahead of the green blob from A to C? Um, that haven't been processed yet, and and the forwarded copy from B raises ahead of those. Okay, so this is where uh, the issue of a low-level acknowledgement becomes important, which is the only things you have to redundantly send through the other path are is the tra is the traffic that A had sent to C at that point, for which A has not received an acknowledgement. Uh, okay. So it'll send everything. And, and that, just to be so, so the existing systems that, mo that have mostly been built don't do this, yes. right? If to the extent that yeah. you do not forward unacknowledged traffic from A to B to C, the 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 B's ability to communicate with C will depend on mm -hmm. A and C catching up. Right. And so, if there's a partition between A and C, you're all hosed. Right, so, so, so this is entirely a robustness, redundancy optimization. Well, well no, there's also trust issues. There's a, there's a denial of liveness attack uh, that uh, you're, you're, you're vulnerable to if you don't do this redundant traffic. You're, you, I'm sorry, you're either vulnerable to denial of liveness or you have to recapture or, or you have to have weaker uh, ordering expectations. The... Uh, Denial of liveness is just a form of partition in this context, right? No, 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 no. A denial of liveness means that under a particular partition condition, oh, I'm sorry. Let's. I'm sorry. It's it's it's. Um, it means that one of the entities can cause a logical partition where the partition was not exogenous. So in other words, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine, fine. So so with this redundant traffic, uh, we never has to wait on A to continue talking to C. And, and without this, this thing, then B, A can induce a partition effectively between B and C, and that's an attack. Simply but it can only do that C. on the initial setup, on the initial establishment of the connection between B and C. No, 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 no. This is any further, even if B and C are already connected, uh, further traffic from a to B that needs to uh, be about states of Carol that are the successor states of Carol having processed previous messages from Alice, then that has to force those prior message, messages from Alice to get delivered so that the stateful assumptions in, the, in carrying the Carol reference in the foo message are preserved. After the kick from is all processed, and finish. Oh, then there's no more forwarding for the take from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For yeah, but but I'm saying this is not specific to handoff. This is any time you're trying to do okay. this uh, kind of work. Okay. So now let me talk about. The, let me finish okay. this scenario. Real quick. Okay. So my point is that everything that's handed across is to re resolve the resolves or protects against these issues up to the point of completing this handoff. Yes. Okay. Yes. Which means you could, for example, just say, you know what, I'm going to just include the previous 10 messages. I don't need acknowledgement. I just assume our rate is kind of up to date. To the extent that A is correct about the messages that, that, that A will hand to B to redundantly provide some protection. I'm sorry, I, I, I need you to disambiguate some pronouns. 
who redundantly ah. says what? So that A is providing a copy to B right. of unacknowledged messages from C. I unacknowledged messages to from, from A. A to C. Right. 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 If that A included some messages that happen to be acknowledged. Oh, that would be harmless. That would be harmless. Right. So my, if it happened to not include some messages that were actually unacknowledged, then it is not succeeded in providing as much context, co context right. and protection, but it is provided some. Well, so, so in that case, what happens is um, it's A's, uh, A, what A told B to deliver was supposed to have been adequate for B to continue talking. So if A didn't provide what was adequate, that's on A. Right. And therefore, B can continue talking to C after it's delivered whatever A asked it to deliver. Right. Because it's no longer, uh, uh, B no longer has any obligation to wait for, for a coordination with A. Meaning that C has a commitment to um, honor the request from A via B as if it were a complete update to its set of requests from A? The, so uh, this is assuming we're, we're looking at a... All right, let, let, let's, yeah. let me propose we pop that. Yeah. My point was getting to what, whether or not we need acknowledgments, but that's too far than we need to go here. Okay, but okay. I have a more fundamental question. So okay. if we frame this in the terms of data availability, mm -hmm. if I understand this correctly, what we're doing here is saying that we want data availability of a subset of A state on B insofar as it will relate to known transactions between B and C. So yes. that A cannot deny data availability, because A has already sent, uh, has like right. committed something on an outbound that's key right. at this point. That's We're right. already relying on A every time. That's right. Because that's what's needed for authentication. Mm -hmm. The authentication yes. doesn't change. So we're getting data availability on B as part of A. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is useful, but it does seem very expensive, mm -hmm. right? Because that if we're sending F, like, unacknowledged chunks in every message from A to B. So, uh, is so, that quadratic? Okay. So and, um, so in the, the worst case um, uh, is that it, it is combinatorially expensive, probably quadratic. Uh, but these chains keep getting truncated by acknowledgments. And in a blockchain situation where the partition boundaries are orthogonal to the replication boundaries typically, then as long as B is in a partition where it can see that you know um, that this is a message that's obligated to be delivered to C, then B could, that's that's adequate that's an yeah, adequate yeah. storage for B to to know about this message so that it can cause it to be delivered ahead of, ahead. So uh, so so um, so there's a bunch of and you, so in the case where you just have infinite logs for chain participants and you've got redundancy that crosses partition boundaries, which are useful for read purposes. They're not useful for update purposes if you're not in the supermajority on the partition, but they're still useful for read purposes. Uh, then a lot of the engineering can make the, a lot of these overheads go away. But logically, this is the availability that you need. Okay, so, so, so it's not really necessary for B to store A's message queue in state or like do processing on it or commit to it. it we're just like, what, uh, attempting to attain whatever data availability guarantees B has for A state. Right. So that could be locking it. Or That's right. That right? Okay. That's right. That's exactly right. And and uh, I'm really glad you asked because that's the first time I talked through that aspect of the engineering. Okay. Um, so, um, and then sometime later, C comes back online because of the um, uh, at the the before the uh, happens before link by whatever means that message arrives first it copies this capability into the Carol A to B index in that table and then this message arrives uh, copying out of the table so the individual entries in the table only live for the handoff it's only the entries in these tables that are longer mm -hmm. and at that point. You've completed the uh, the delivery of the message to Bob, and Bob has a, a reference through all the bookkeeping to Carol. So the key uh, issue, the key naming issue, by which the object layer um, crosses into the underlying uh, IBC layer, is the issue of naming the endpoints. 
It might be that before this happened, that B had never heard of that C, and that C had never heard of that B. Um, uh, so the question is, how do they valid? How do they validate when they've never even heard of each other beforehand, uh, and they've only heard of each other by virtue of these messages that came from A? So, um, so there's this general notion of a self-authenticating designator, which is a name for something where the name gives you all of the information that you need to figure out whether something that is allegedly the thing that the name names, whether that actually is the thing that the name names. So the most familiar example of that is a, um, is a cryptographic hash of just immutable data. Uh, the hash gives you everything you know, need to, to know so that without relying on any other authority, you can now validate that alleged data is the data designated by that designator. Uh, over here, um, we're, not talk we're talking about designating these active objects. So the name, as a for the name to be a self-authenticating designator, it has, to, it has to tell you two things. It has to say um, uh, how to send to the name thing and how to uh, and, um, so that so that um, so that the name thing will receive the message um, uh, and treat it as something that was legitimately sent, uh, and then how to receive from the name thing so that you're only so that you're validating that alleged message from that endpoint actually is the message to the endpoint. Um, and this was a whole bunch of single machine, non-chain, non non quorum like systems, just single machine endpoint systems. So for, for, the, for the single machine endpoint systems, which is just a one-to-one -one TLS connection, which the self-authenticating designator is just a public key finger. Um, and we're, stuck, we're no longer doing that, even among single machines, because it just doesn't generalize. So um, uh, where you treat each message individually as something to be encrypted and signed or decrypted and verified, that works between endpoints in a way that generalizes to let's say just permission quorums, um, but then for general chains uh, to talk, you can always just use the equivalent of a like client, and then to listen, uh, depending on the nature of the other chain, you might need to go all the way to the full node plus finality thresholding, or hopefully you can just do the equivalent of a like client listening, but it depends on the nature of the chain. So where do these names show up? Um, which is the, uh, in a system with global names, like public key fingerprints, then, then this thing has the name A, and it knows the name B and C. Over here, C knows, the, in, the, in the initial conditions here, C knows the name A, uh, B knows the name A, but C does not know the name B, B does not know the name C. So um, if, when, C receives this message, the message contains the name of B. So at this point, C learns the name of B. And likewise, with that message, B learns the name of C. And by learning the name of C, it sets up the, you know, it starts setting up the connection, tries to establish a connection to C. Likewise, C tries to establish a connection to B. And the key, the key thing that enables this thing to succeed is that the name that B, um, that the, the B name that C has heard from A is the same B name that C hears from B as a result of B trying to establish a connection to C. So there's this closing of the loop with regard to naming identity. Isn't that only for reference? I'm sorry? It doesn't look like I'm unresolved. So that B, when first that A says to C, when that B, that B. Is so right now, a. yeah. So right now, I'm just showing the VAT name. I'm not, yeah. not no longer showing the capabilities, because I'm saying that the in order for the capability logic, the handoff logic, to work, the key thing is that C hears the name B uh, from two different paths. It hears it directly from A. But in, it doesn't. The diagram didn't show like C acting on that B when it heard it from that B. The, the, this bubble popping up on the scene. 
Oh, that's because, so, so yeah, B find what's going on here. So B, when it hears about C from A, it starts setting up a connection. And in setting up a connection, it sets up the, you know, the, the, the talk and listen devices over here. And it also contacts C and asks C to set up a connection back to it. I mean, basically, to be the counterparty of the connection. And so C, in setting up being, becoming a counterparty of the connection, has to establish the, the, the bookkeeping to be the counterparty. So, uh, and in becoming a counterparty, it learns the name B as part of the connection establishment. And the key thing is that the B name that it hears this way has to be um, uh, checkably the same as the B name that it hears over there. It doesn't have to be bit for bit identical. Uh, and that's, that's important because uh, with stateful, um, stateful things where you're tracking the latest state that you've heard of of the chain, uh, you need to basically so a, a prefix predicate. If one, if one name is a valid prefix of the other name, then you can always update the latest name you've heard. Um, uh, so in any case, so, so there's this naming identity there, but then stop, and then, and then the, the other naming identity is that um, when B sends the message to pick up the reference, this A name has to be checkably the same as that. So you have to have name identity on both paths for both of those names. Okay. Now, uh, now I can get to a question that you asked yesterday that caused me to, to do a whole bunch of work on the slides last night, um, uh, which is um, uh, the in a case where we've got routing through hubs for purposes of chain validity, that chain validity is semantically significant. A reaching B through H is logically very different than A directly um, validating B. It's, it's because now it's, it's a weaker trust. A is depending on uh, its ability to validate H and depending on H's claims about having validated B. Um, and uh, so, so uh, this thing so far, I've only presented names as absolute names, and the absolute names doesn't deal with um, how you name things when you're naming things from a local position in a routing fabric. So now, if you if we think of these names as being global coordinates in some kind of abstract space, what we now want to do is to is to forget about global coordinates and think about local addressing, where one, something that's in, a given, that's in one position in an abstract space is trying to do relative addressing of something that's in another position in an abstract space. So if we got 10 minutes. Got 10 minutes. OK. You can always continue after lunch. Yeah. Um, OK. Um, so I'm, OK. Uh, I haven't gotten to pegging. Uh, if um, yeah. okay, okay, good. So I'm almost good. I'm almost done with this one. So I'm, I'm plus good. So uh, what's going on here is that the thing that A now knows uh, as the name of C is just you know, we're just using as an analogy a vector space. So it knows the displacement from A to C as a vector in that direction. It knows that its displacement from A to B as a vector in that direction. What do you mean direction? Well, so this is. Ah, these are names in an abstract it, it, vector space. Yeah. So just we're using we're using vector space as an yeah. analogy. Yeah. Uh, you're you're given where you are in some abstract space, like a routing fabric, which is yeah. where we're going to come back to. Given where you are, how do I talk about the other thing from where I am? But a route is not a vector. If you have like a multi-dimensional vector space, I'm, I'm, there I'm, are points. A route is like a multi vector right. I'm, I'm, I'm using, using a vector space as an analogy. Okay, okay. <laughs> I, will, I, I will deconstruct the analogy okay. momentarily. But the analogy, it was, it was, I mean, I couldn't think about this until I thought in terms of the analogy. And then I was able to deconstruct it. Um, so likewise, C knows the direction to go to get to A, but doesn't know anything about B and vice versa. So it's the same knowledge relationships, but now just with regard to relative naming. So in order for A to tell C about B, uh, we have this 
logical subtraction operator, and what the subtraction operator means depends on the concreteness of what, what we mean by this analogy to vectors. So whatever we mean by vectors, that we, mean, we mean subtraction in that space. Sure. So uh, given that A knows these two relative names, it does the subtraction to get the name that it should tell C to explain to C how to get to B. But that doesn't explain how to. Well, it, 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 uh, it does, it does. Um, because what we're, what we're talking about is self-authenticating designators. What we're talking about, the names have to serve the role of self-authenticating designators. It has to tell C enough that C can validate B. And, and, but, but, but hold that question until okay. I, I get to the slide that answers it. But, but, but don't drop the question. Okay, so <laughs> having calculated this, now without any, any global names for, for that, it's basically, you know, I say to you, where now it's pronouns relative to the connection, when the thing that you will, that, that's in that direction from you asks you for this index, give it the Carroll object. And likewise does the subtraction that way, and says to B, when the thing in that direction for you asks for, for Carol A to B, I'm sorry, ask it to pick up um, uh, the thing that, that, we, that this guy left for it at Carol A to B. So now the, the bilateral connection is set up over here, and now this and this have to be checkably equal. In, um, No. No. What's going on here is. No, the first one. Yeah. So over here, A, th this for A names C. A is trying to explain to B how to get to C. So A subtracts from this how A gets to B, and what's left is how B should get to B. I'm sorry, how B should get to C. Did I say B the whole time? Um, let me just repeat. This is how A gets to C. This is how A gets to B. So in order for A to explain to B how to get to C, A has to subtract how it gets to B, and what's left is how B should get to C. Okay. So then B, in order to formulate the, the, the message to, to C to pick up the reference, does its own arithmetic to figure out how, how C would get back to A. And then the key thing is that these two are the same. And with these two identities, you can complete the handoff through the handoff table. OK. Now let's deconstruct the, the vector metaphor. So let's take a look at some possible subtra logical subtraction operators. Well, one is that if x logical subtract y is just x, then what you've done is you're fill, you're, you're, you just have, have your, this is sort of the degenerate case of just absolute names, right? So when you want to deal with absolute names, you just define that subtraction operator. Now you just have the absolute names. Um, naive retracing of paths, and this is the start of the answer to your question about uh, chain validation, is that um, uh, if A is trying to explain, I need to peek ahead. Hold on. Yeah. If, if A is telling B how to get to C, what he says is right. send the message through me. Yeah, yeah. Right. So this basically, if this is how I get to one side and this is how I get to the other side, then in order to explain to the guy I would get to over here how to get to this guy, you do the you, you flip each of these in directionality. Um, and you also put them in, in inverse order, and then basically you explain, get, retrace the path to get back to me, and then go from me to the other guys. So then you're always rooting back through yourself. If we compare the arguments as the like client, then does the second way we used yesterday, the thorough validity predicate, can be also the So, the, so, the, so yeah. So because what we're concerned about is chain validation. These would be validation paths, because that's the only thing that's semantically significant. Hops. Oh. Hops. Oh, that's right. Or hops, that's right. Paths. That's right. Yeah. So now, concretely, 
if A is explaining to C how to get to B, and we've got H as the, as the hub for validation purposes, then the path from A to H and H to B minus the path from A to H to H to C is basically telling C, go through the, path, go through the hub to get back to B, then go from me back through the hub to get to B. But clearly, these two things cancel. And now I can just tell C, go to the hub and get to B. This cannot be in any, in any trust sense worse than this. This is clearly better than this, because once you have this, you're no longer dependent on A. And there's no way in which you have a, dependent, a trust dependency here that you didn't already have here. So you can always simplify these things to these things. And this is, in fact, what you want to explain to C as a um, validation chain trust relationship preserving name for B. Mm -hmm. Even if C could connect directly to B, not through the hub, or maybe through a different hub, if it connects through a different hub, that would not necessarily be a valid interpretation of the meaning of the introduction. Okay. And then mm -hmm. we can compose these things. So this is minus absolute, this is minus path. So we can compose a minus absolute path by saying um, a pair of designators, x, x1, x2, minus compose y1, y2, is um, uh, composed with A, composed with P. So the algebra has a nice compositional property. And this is exactly what we want for our case, where in fact each endpoint has an absolute name and has a chain validity path. And we want to um, we want the composition of these things to explain to C this is the absolute name for B, and this is the the, the chain validation path to B. True. That answers, I guess, the question you were asking about uh, right. getting both. So now there's no more literal vectors. It's all just paths yeah, yeah, yeah. Paths through That's validation. That's not chains. quite sure of a qualifies space, because what's the basis? But right, right. It's not yeah, a vector yeah. space. It's just yeah, an analogy. just the way I think about it. Yeah. yeah. And I could not have gotten here if I didn't draw no, vectors it's, first. it's a good analogy. Yeah. yeah. Can you say again um, why you don't want to have equations that talk about if the, if the hubs are different? I didn't understand the question. Uh, in the third case here, um, where A talks through the hub to B, and a talks through the, the hub to see what if those are different hubs. Oh, then you can't short. You cannot short. These because two, because these two the terms, term, these two terms. trust validation. That's right. right. That's right. If you have separately trusted, if, if this is H1 and this is H2, and neither one is strictly more trusted than the other, then there's no basis for canceling, and this is the shortest path you have. Okay. So the part I don't understand is this assumes A knows about all the connectivity. It knows there's a hub H and a hub H1 and H2 and how B and C are connected to H and H1. Right? No, all, all it knows. Because basically A computes a route for, from B to C. Okay, so right, so the, the, thing, the key thing is what's the required starting knowledge so that everything else can be derived from the starting knowledge. Right. Uh, and so over here, the only assumption is that A's starting knowledge is a validation path from A to B, which clearly A needs in order to have, since A is assumed to already be talking to B, it must already know of some validation path to get things yeah. to B. It knows that it talks to B via H. Right. And it um, knows that it talks to A or C via H. Right. And that's, that's all the starting knowledge that it needs in this scenario together with knowing that it's the same H. Yeah. If it knows it's the same H, it can cancel these terms. If it doesn't know it's the same H, it cannot cancel these terms. The other thing you can, come, can conclude from that is both C and B are talking to H, and so there's no reason for them to... Right. Well, yeah, that, 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 that would be the special case where it's just a hub topology. But this basically, you can have an arbitrary topology now what's going on here is, if there's a join point where from there you would go to A, 
through some, some other path and come back again and then go to C, you can truncate the part where you just go, basically, you can truncate the self-contained loops. You just get rid of the loops, and then you have the path excluding the loop. Mm -hmm. But, because, okay, because the what the, the the integrity criteria for completing the handoff is that the C that I'm sorry the the B that C connects to must must C must know that the B it's connecting to is the B that A met. If, if, if C connects to B through, uh, through another path, let's say through a separate, different hub, then that different hub has different trust assumptions. And, um, uh, and because of those different trust assumptions, because it's, it's using a validator that A is not endorsing, uh, that chain to B through H2 uh, is not a valid interpretation by C of the introduction that A met. So even, even though you already said uh, it's got a self-identifying name, if you get there by the wrong path, uh, you can't rely on the messages that you get. Well, the, the name is more complicated. So in, in the solo, solo that case, the name can just be a public key, actually public key. That's nice and simple, that's nice and absolute. In the chain case, it's really all of the history of the chain I've observed up to now is a part of the name I want to. Right? If there's any divergence between the set of blocks that I've seen, we've seen we're not really talking the same chain. And, and so each of these kind of vectors here is actually dynamic over time. It would include something about the history that I've seen up until recent, the last month. Um, and I want to make sure that you are seeing at least as, as that same set of blocks. So that we're talking to I'm not saying the whole thing is really between the same hub. Yeah. Same hub is what's required only for the truncation. Only stack. to collapse it. If, if this yeah, hub. Okay, but, but then, again, yeah, the same question. Why cannot B figure out its own, on its own? The same way A figured out how to get to B by a A. No, no, no. A didn't figure that out. How does it know? It's a starting condition. So, so, okay, but B has. Right. It was a okay. previous so, third party handout. Right. So, this, so, okay, so now we get to one of the core assumptions of object capabilities which is this thing I was mentioning before of only connectivity begets connectivity. There's an obvious line there, which is how do you bring about connectivity in the first place? So there's some out-of-band introduction where somebody gives you a like client and tells you what it's a like client for or something. There's some out-of-band introduction, but once you're past the bootstrap phase and now you have in-band connectivity, then A should have only ever heard about B through similar logic. And therefore, that's how A came to know a path to B, is because the same logic happened earlier, or it was part of the initial conditions established by out of band. I think we should take a break, but my subsequent question would be what if it's not a problem? Okay. So then the question is is there a name that A can have for B that, B, that A can understand what to do with, that's self authenticating? So that A, so that if the name for B is adequate for A to authenticate, mm -hmm. and that name is what some introducer, either in band or out of band, out of band, but is that name is what the introducer meant to introduce A to, then you're fine. But the, the assumption here with the hub is that the hub might be speaking a deep, different language on each spoke. And A might not even know how to speak to B, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So in that case, in order for A to have a self-authenticating designator, the only thing it can designate for that A can use would be a, would be a path where A's immediate language is a, is a language that A knows how to speak. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think, yes, I'm at the end of that presentation. And we can break for lunch. Okay. Let me check if lunch is here.